Well, Switzerland has some real strengths. It has a highly educated population. It already has a, a very good social safety net. I know there's even been talk about putting in a basic income. So in many ways, Switzerland is further along in this transformation than most other countries. And in the end, by the way, I want to be clear that this should be a good transformation for the whole world. We should have a bigger pie, more wealth, and we sh if we can come up with ways of distributing that wealth more evenly, I think it'll be a good uh, outcome for everybody. So Switzerland's in very strong position being very innovative, technology driven. But there are also some risks for Switzerland. Switzerland's a relatively small country, and in the new economy, globalization is becoming more and more important. Being able to have large scale and reach many consumers. And for Switzerland to be successful, their companies are going to have to address markets not just of Switzerland or even of Europe, but globally. And that's going to be a challenge for some of the Swiss companies. The United States starts with a very large population. China starts with a very large population. So in some ways, it's easier for those entrepreneurs to address big markets. Switzerland has to have a focus on the global market, not just the local market, if they're going to be successful. There will be a paperback version mm -hmm. of your book, and you're discussing the findings. I mean, what, I mean, as Technology changes fast. It changes uh, since the publishing of your book. What, what, what are your findings or what changed? We published our book in January of 2014. And so the paperback is about to come out and it provides this interesting opportunity to say, okay, what have we learned since we finished writing the book just about two years ago? And the main thing that I've learned is that the future is coming even more quickly than we thought when we were researching and when we were writing the book. Um, the, we completely, I believe, underestimated the advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning that we're seeing out there. We continue to underestimate how, more, how much more powerful and capable autonomous vehicles can get. And I think they're coming relatively quickly to, to our highways and to our roads. So even though I'm supposed to do this for a living, it's really easy for me to underestimate technological progress. There are a number of things that we can do to improve the job situation. First and most importantly, we can invest more in education, both as a society and each of us individually can participate in some of the online learning, lifelong learning, and develop the new skills that are valued in the second machine age. The second thing is we can encourage entrepreneurship, not because we expect everyone to become an entrepreneur, but rather because we need people to invent new jobs and industries, new goods and services. And the people in our system that are in charge of inventing those new industries, we call them entrepreneurs. So we need more of them to invent the new work that will replace the old work. The third thing we can do is invest more in basic research and R&D to help make the overall pie bigger. That's a role for government to be investing. And a fourth thing we can do is develop a better social safety net. I know there's been talk about uh, basic income. In America, there's something we call the earned income tax credit, or wage subsidies, where the government will supplement the wages that people earn at the low end to help bring their uh, value of work increasing. We can have more generous health insurance and other uh, aspects of the safety net so that the people who don't do as well in the second machine age can be helped out by the rest of us. As technology races ahead so much, the main problem that we're going to face is not specifically a jobs problem. It's a problem that our institutions don't change as quickly. Our governments don't change as quickly. Policies don't change as quickly. Uh, our, our educational systems don't change as quickly. So we have relatively slow changing societies with very, very quickly changing technologies. The mismatch between those two is what we need to worry about. And that mismatch can manifest itself in an educational system that doesn't turn out people with the right skills. It can manifest itself in policies that are not well matched to what's actually going on. It can manifest itself with not enough jobs or wages that are not going up. So I think what we, what we really need to work on is not trying to slow down technology or make it change direction, but trying to make sure that, that the rest of the parts of our society can, can keep up with the change and take advantage of the benefits that technology brings. It, it's tempting to just see technology as a job killer. That, that's not what it is. Technology is also what allows us to live healthier lives.
that will bring us better medical care, that will bring us better educational opportunities, that will let us stay in touch with our families and our loved ones, that will entertain us more. Technology is this unbelievable gift that we have. Our job is to, again, to try to be flexible enough to keep up with it. I think there are challenges that are going to come up as technology races ahead. One of the most important ones is going to be about jobs and wages and what does a meaningful life look like? What does a healthy community look like when they're not dominated by the idea of a job or the idea of work that we had in the industrial era? Because again, in my lifetime, I think that's going to change in a pretty profound way. We're talking about a world with vastly more wealth, where robots can produce many of the goods and services we need, and where we need less work. That should be a good thing. We should be happy to have more wealth with less work. Shame on us if we turn that into a bad thing. And the key is to make sure we have a way of allocating the bounty, the wealth, from this new system. Right now, we're in a very rocky stage where many people are actually being made worse off because although the pie is getting bigger, their share is shrinking. It doesn't have to be that way. We can design a system where not only does the pie get bigger, but everybody's share also gets bigger. And one of the reasons we wrote the book, The Second Machine Age, is to help people understand that this is an opportunity for us to work together to create more shared prosperity. The key lesson is that technology is not destiny. We shape our destiny. Technology is a tool and we can use it to shape whatever kind of world we want. And the job of us is to seize that opportunity.